Barcarolla's Foundations of Psychiatric Mental Health Nursing, 8th Edition, Chapter 28, Child, Older Adult, and Intimate Partner Violence. Key Terms and Concepts, Active Commission, Active Omission, Crisis Situation, Economic Abuse, Emotional Abuse, Family Violence, Neglect, Perpetrator, Physical Abuse, Primary Prevention, Safety Plan, Secondary Prevention, Sexual Abuse, Shelters or Safe Houses, Survivor, Tertiary Prevention, Vulnerable Person. There's no place like home. That is a statement familiar to most of us, and home is a source of refuge and peace for many. Yet for some children, adults, and elders, the home is a dangerous place where family members or intimate partners demonstrate disregard for the rights of others. Family violence, also called domestic violence, is among the most important public health issues of the United States. Nurses are in a unique position to respond to family violence and are educated to identify, evaluate, and treat both victims and perpetrators of violence. Types of abuse. Legal definitions of family or domestic violence vary from state to state. Forty-six states have specific definitions in their civil statutes. Generally speaking, the major types of abuse include the following. Physical abuse is the infliction of physical pain or bodily harm such as slapping, punching, hitting, choking, pushing, restraining, biting, throwing, and burning. Sexual abuse is any form of sexual contact or exposure without consent or in circumstances in which the victim is incapable of giving consent. Sexual abuse is also referred to as sexual assault or rape and is discussed in Chapter 29. Emotional abuse is the undermining of a person's self-worth. This may include constant criticism, humiliating, diminishing one's abilities, name-calling, intimidating, isolating, and damaging relationships with others. Neglect is the failure to provide for physical, emotional, educational, and medical needs. Economic abuse is controlling a person's access to economic resources, making an individual financially dependent. Forbidding school attendance or employment keeps a person dependent. Crisis situation. Anyone may be at risk for abuse in a crisis situation or a situation that puts stress on a family with a violent member. A person with effective impulse control, problem-solving skills, and a healthy support system is less likely to resort to violence. However, stressful life events tax coping skills, leaving the perpetrator incapable of dealing with the situation. Social isolation caused by frequent moves or an inability to make friends contributes to an ineffective coping during crisis situations. Perpetrator and the vulnerable person. The term perpetrator applies to any member of a household who is violent toward another member such as parents, partners, siblings, and extended family members. Perpetrators often consider their own needs to be more important than anyone else's and look toward others to meet their needs. Both male and female perpetrators perceive themselves as having poor social skills. They describe their relationships with their partners as being the closest they have ever known, and they typically lack supportive relationships outside the relationship. The vulnerable person is the family member upon whom abuse is perpetrated. This individual is variously referred to as the victim, survivor, or victim slash survivor. Using the term survivor recognizes the recovery and healing process that follows victimization and does not have the connotation of passivity that victim has. Child abuse. In 2014, there were 3.6 million referrals for child abuse and neglect. The most common form of abuse was neglect, 78%, followed by physical abuse, 18%, and sexual abuse, 9%. Other types of abuse, including emotional and threatened abuse, parents, drug and alcohol abuse, or lack of supervision, made up the remaining 11%. Child abuse can take the form of something improper that is done to a child, which is an act of commission, Acts of commission are deliberate and intentional. They include physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. An act of omission or neglect occurs when a child's basic physical, emotional, or educational needs are not met or when a child is not protected from harm. Acts of omission include physical neglect, emotional neglect, medical and dental neglect, educational neglect, inadequate supervision, and exposure to violence. Epidemiology. Girls are slightly more likely to be abused and make up 51% of the victims. In general, the younger children are, the more vulnerable they are to abuse. Tragically, children under the age of 1 account for 24% of all abuse cases. 
Approximately 80% of children who die are younger than four years of age, and boys die at a slightly higher rate than girls. In 2014, nearly 1,600 children died of abuse and neglect. That's sad. The prevalence of sexual abuse in children is difficult to determine due to the fact that children are not are often unable to describe their experience. About 40% do not exhibit clear symptoms of sexual abuse. Uh, relatively uncommon in infants, sexual abuse increases with age. By age 17, sexual abuse and sexual assault occur in nearly 27% of all girls and 5% of all boys. Adults are responsible for these cases of abuse and assault about 11% of the time for girls and about 2% for boys. Females are at most risk in late adolescence. About 92% of child abuse perpetrators are the victim's parents. Females are somewhat more likely to abuse children. Women make up 51% of the perpetrators. The prevalence of child abuse varies within ethnic communities. Table 28.1 gives statistics related to abuse rates and fatalities within various ethnicities. Risk factors. Children are most likely to be abused if they are younger than four years of age. Other risk factors for child abuse include being perceived as being different due to temperamental traits, congenital abnormalities, or chronic disease. Perhaps the child reminds the parents of someone they do not like, such as an ex-spouse. Children who do not live up to the parents' fantasy of what the child should be are at risk. Children who are the result of unwanted pregnancies are at higher risk. Okay, table 28.1 is the breakdown by ethnicity. So we got total abuse cases. African American is 21.4%. American Indian or Alaska Native is 1.6%. Children of multiple races are 7.5%, Hispanic is 22.7%, white is 44%, Asian is 0.9%. Total child fatalities is African American 30.3%, uh, American Indian or Alaska Native 0.6%, multiple races 3.8%, Hispanic 15.1%, white 43%, and Asian 1.1%. Interference with emotional bonding between parents and child, which can occur because of premature birth or prolonged illness requiring hospitalization, has also been found to increase the risk for future abuse. Adolescents are abused at least as frequently as, as younger children. However, such abuse is often overlooked, perhaps because society views adolescents as capable of defending themselves. Box 28.1 identifies characteristics of parents who abuse their children. Here's the box. One, a history of abuse, neglect, or emotional deprivation as a child, family authoritarianism, low self-esteem, feeling of worthlessness, depression, poor coping skills, social isolation, involvement in a crisis situation, unrealistic expectations of the child's behavior, frequent use of harsh punishment, history of severe mental illness such as schizophrenia, violent temper outbursts, expects the child to satisfy needs for love, support, and reassurance, projection of blame onto the child, parents' troubles, inability to seek help from others, perception of the child as bad or evil, history of drug or alcohol abuse, feeling of little or no control over life, low tolerance for frust frustration, and poor impulse control. Comorbidity. The occurrence of one type of abuse is a fairly strong predictor of the occurrence of another type. Secondary effects of abuse such as anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation are healthcare issues that can last a lifetime. Major depressive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder are two of the most prevalent disorders resulting from childhood trauma. Family violence is common in the child histories of juvenile offenders, runaway violent criminals, prostitutes, and those who turn, in turn are violent towards others. Exposure to abuse can adversely affect a child's development because the energy needed to successfully accomplish development is instead devoted to coping with abuse. Abused adolescents exhibit more psychopathological changes, poorer coping and social skills, a higher incidence of disassociative identity disorder, and poor impulse control than do other adolescents. Women who are victims of prolonged childhood sexual abuse are more likely to develop major psychiatric distress. Intimate partner violence. Intimate partner violence include physical violence, rape, and or stalking, and psychological aggression by a current or former intimate partner. The intimate partner may be a spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, dating partner, or ongoing sexual partner. 
Four or five victims of intimate partner violence are women. Females between the age of 18 and 34 experience the highest rate of intimate partner violence. Nearly half of married couples have instances of abuse. Evidence suggests that intimate partner violence affects same-sex relationship at about the same rates as heterosexual relationships. One out of ten homicides is due to spousal murder, and about a third of females who are killed are or were in an intimate relationship with their killer. Cycle of Violence Walker, 1979, describes a pattern of behavior that perpetrators of violence may use to control their partners. The cycle consists of three stages, the tension building stage, the acute battering stage, and the honeymoon stage. The tension building stage begins with minor incidents such as pushing, shoving, and verbal abuse. During this time, the victim often ignores or accepts the behavior due to fear of escalation. Abusers then rationalize that their behavior is acceptable. As the tension builds, both participants may try to reduce it. The abuser may try to reduce the tension with the use of alcohol or drugs, and the victim may try to reduce the tension by minimizing the importance of the incidents. I should have had the house neater, or I should have had dinner ready. The acute battering stage occurs when the tension peaks. It is usually triggered by an external event or by the abuser's emotional state. Some experts believe that the victim may actually provoke the incident to remove the tension and fear and to move on to the honeymoon phase. After the abuse occurs, the abuser and the victim enter a period of calm known as the honeymoon stage. During this stage, the abuser usually demonstrates kindness and loving behaviors. The abuser, at least initially, feels remorseful and apologetic and may make presents, make promises, and tell the victim how much she is loved and needed. The victim usually feels needed and loved and hopes for change. Legal proceedings or plans to leave, initi plans to leave initiated during the acute battering stage may be abandoned. Unfortunately, without intervention, the cycle will repeat itself. Over time, periods of calmness and safety become briefer, and the periods of anger and fear are more intense. Each repeat of the pattern erodes the victim's self-esteem. The victim either believes the violence was deserved or accepts the blame for it. This can lead to feelings of depression, hopelessness, immobilization, and self-deprecation. Uh, there's a nice little chart at the bottom of the page. It's a circle. Uh, risk factors. Men who abuse may believe in male dominance and need to be in charge. Physically acting out makes them feel more in control, more masculine, and more powerful. Parent-child interactions, peer group experiences, observations of the partner dyad, and the influence of media uh, support the same message. Males can expect to be in a position of power in relationships and may use physical aggression to maintain the position. Pathological jealousy is a characteristic of intimate partner abuser. Many perpetrators refuse to allow their partners to work outside the home. Some demand that their partners work in the same place as they do so that they can monitor activities and friendships. It is common for abusers to accompany their partners to and from activities. They may forbid the victim from having personal friends as to participate in activities outside the home. Perpetrators may restrict mobility by monitoring an odometer and keeping stopwatches. Even after imposing such restrictions, abusers often accuse their partners of infidelity or other acts of betrayal. Controlling finances and expenditures is an additional means of limiting the freedom of the abused. Individuals are more likely to engage in family violence when they use substances. Alcohol and other drugs, illicit or prescribed, tend to weaken inhibitions and lead to a disregard of social rules prohibiting violence. The victim may rationalize that alcohol and drugs caused the abuse, saying he was drunk and didn't know what he was doing. However, even when drug and alcohol use is reduced or eliminated, family violence usually still occurs. Pregnancy may trigger or increase violence. The partner may resent the added responsibility a baby entails, or he may resent the relationship the baby will have with his mate. Violence also escalates when the woman makes a move towards independence, such as visiting friends without permission, getting a job, or going back to school. Victims are at greatest risk for violence when they threaten or actually leave the relationship. Um, older adult abuse. For many older adults, the golden years are anything but golden. It can be a sad, stressful time filled with pain, anxiety, and poverty. Older adult mistreatment is defined as intentional actions that cause harm or creates a risk of harm to a vulnerable person. 
This mistreatment includes failure to provide for the older adult's basic needs or to protect them from harm. Family members, custodians, and care facility personnel may inflict physical abuse and sexual abuse. Financial abuse is an additional problem in this population. Characters may, caretakers may steal cash or credit cards or coerce the older person to transfer property or accounts. Victims also lose personal belongings, vehicles, medication, and food stamps. All 50 states have enacted laws to prosecute older adult abuse. Abuse of older adults is too commonly found in the news. Recent examples include an 87-year-old woman in Missouri died two days after being found naked and lying in a bed soaked with urine and fecal matter. Her daughter was charged in the incident. She said she'd have taken better care, better care of her, but she was too tired. New Jersey healthcare workers wearing floral scrubs were caught on camera as they lashed out, striking helpless patients. Workers were seen roughly force-feeding a 91-year-old Alzheimer's patient and ignoring a woman who fell to the floor. A 26-year-old man who worked at a senior living center in Illinois faced charges of aggravated criminal sexual assault after he tried to pay other men to sexually assault patients. He allegedly wanted to capture the abuse on videos or pictures. Good Lord. The CDC estimates that about 1 in 10 older adults uh, over the age of 60 are victims of abuse. This number may be far higher in that for every case reported, five go unreported. This lack of reporting may be due to isolation, dependency, and fear of retaliation. Further complicating the picture is that the older adult may be caring for him or herself, which creates the potential for self-neglect. Elder abuse occurs in both institutional and family settings. Family members are often the perpetrators in most of the incidents. Risk factors. Older adults may become vulnerable because they are in poor mental or physical health or are disrupted due to disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. The dependency needs of older adults are usually what put them at risk for abuse. The typical victim is female, over 75 years of age, Caucasian, living with a relative and experiencing a physical and or mental impairment. Caring for older adults can be stressful in the best of cases, but in families in which violence is a coping strategy, the potential for abuse is high. Parents who abuse their own children are more likely to end up as targets for abuse by their offspring. A spouse who is abused may retaliate in later years by responding with violence to failing physical or cognitive health. Application of the nursing process. Assessment. General assessment. You will encounter victims of violence in every healthcare setting. Therefore, you should screen all patients for possible abuse. Symptoms may be vague and can include chronic pain, insomnia, hyperventilation, or gynecological problems. Attention to the interview process and setting are important to facilitate accurate assessment of physical and behavioral indicators of family violence. All assessments should include questions to elicit a history of sexual abuse, family violence, and drug use or abuse. Any assessment should be completed with the victim alone, and it can be helpful to have an institutional policy that facilitates screening in private. Interview process and setting. You can gather important and relevant information about the family situation by conducting a routine assessment with tact, understanding, and a relaxed attitude. When interviewing, sit near the patient and spend some time establishing trust and rapport before focusing on the details of the violent experience. Establishing trust is crucial if the patient is to feel comfortable enough to self-disclose. The interview should be non-threatening and supportive. It is better to ask about ways of solving disagreements or methods of disciplining children rather than to use the words abuse or violence. It is also important not to assume a person's sexual orientation. Use the term partner when asking about the relationship. Key interviewing guidelines are listed in Box 28.2. The person who experienced the violence should be allowed to tell the story without interruption. Reassure the patient that he or she did nothing wrong. Verbal approaches may include the following. Tell me about what happened to you. Who takes care of you? For children, independent, older adults. What happens when you do something wrong? For children. Or how do you and your partner caregiver resolve dis disagreements? For women, independent, older adults. What do you do for fun? What helps you with your child or parent? What time do you have for yourself? Questions that are open and in require a descriptive response can be less threatening and elicit more relevant information 
than questions that are direct or can be answered with yes or no. What arrangements do you have do you make when you have to leave your child alone? How do you discipline your child? When your infant cries for a long time, how do you get him or her to stop? What about your child's behavior bothers you the most? When trust has been established, openness and directness about the situation can strengthen the relationship with those experiencing or perpetrating violence. Five question assessment tool developed by Sokin and colleagues, 1998, has been used extensively to assist the routine identifications of intimate partner abuse. So box 28.2 interview guidelines do conduct the interview in private. Be direct, honest, and professional. Use language the patient understands. Ask the patient to clarify words not understood. Be understanding. Be attentive. Inform the patient if you must make a referral to Children's or Adult Protective Services and explain the process. Assess safety and help reduce danger at discharge. Do not try to prove abuse by accusations or demand. Display horror, anger, shock, or disapproval at the perpetrator or situation. Place blame or make judgments. Allow the patient to feel at fault or in trouble. Probe or press for answers a patient is not willing to give or conduct the interview with a group of interviewers. And figure 28.2 on the next page is the abuse assessment screening. It's got some graphics and a grading scale and things like that. Uh, assessing various types of abuse. Physical abuse. A series of minor complaints such as headaches, back trouble, dizziness, and accidents, especially falls, may be a covert indicator of violence. Avert signs of battering include bruises, scars, burns, and other wounds in various stages of healing, particularly around the head, face, chest, arms, abdomen, back, and buttocks, and genitalia. Injuries that should arouse a nurse's suspicion are listed in Box 28.3. Box 28.3. Emergency department. Bleeding injuries, especially to the head and face. Internal injuries, concussions, perforated eardrum, abdominal injuries, severe bruising, eye injuries, strangulation marks on neck, back injuries, broken or fractured jaw, arms, pelvis, ribs, clavicle, and legs, burns from cigarettes, appliances, scalding liquids, acids, psychological trauma, anxiety, attacks of, of hyperventilation, heart palpitations, severe crying spells, suicidal tendencies, and miscarriage, ambulatory care settings, perforated eardrums, twisted or stiff neck and shoulder muscles, headache, depression, stress-related conditions, e.g. insomnia, violent nightmares, anxiety, extreme fatigue, eczema, loss of hair, Talk of having problems with husband or son, describing a person as very jealous, impulsive, or an alcohol or substance abuser. Repeated visits with new complaints. Bruises of various ages and specific shapes, such as fingers or belt. And any setting, signs of stress due to family violence, emotional, behavioral, school, or sleep problems, and increase in aggressive behavior. Injuries in a pregnant woman. Recurrent visits for injuries attributed to being accident prone. If the explanation does not match the injury seen, or if the patient minimizes the seriousness of the injury, you should suspect abuse. Ask patients directly in a non-threatening manner if someone close to them has caused them the injury. Observe the nonverbal response such as hesitation or lack of eye contact. Then ask specific questions such as, when was the last time it happened? How often does it happen? In what ways are you hurt? Inconsistent explanations serve as a warning that further investigation is necessary. Vague explanations should also alert the nurse to possible abuse. She fell from a chair from a lap down the stairs. He was running away. The hot water was turned on by mistake. Nonspecific bruising in older children is common. Any bruises on an infant younger than six months of age should be considered suspicious. Shaken baby syndrome, the leading cause of death as a result of physical abuse, usually occurs in children younger than two years old. Injuries are a result of the brain moving in the opposite direction as the baby's head. A baby who has been shaken many may have respiratory problems, bulging fontanelles, retinal hemorrhages, and central nervous system damage resulting in seizures, vomiting, and coma. Sexual abuse. Sexualized behavior is one of the most common symptoms of sexual abuse in children. Younger children may have pre precocious sexual knowledge may draw sexually explicit images or demonstrate sexual aggression. One telling clue is when a child acts out sexual interactions in play, for example, with dolls. Masturbation may be excessive in sexually abused children. In older children, sexual promiscuity is one of the most common symptoms of sexual abuse, and there is a strong connection between sexual abuse and later promiscuity. 
PTSD symptoms such as nightmares, somatic complaints, and feelings of guilt are also common in children who are sexually abused. There are a variety of emotional, behavioral, and physical consequences of sexual abuse, with depression being the most commonly reported symptom by adults who were sexually abused as children. Other consequences include anxiety, suicide, aggression, chronic low self-esteem, chronic pain, obesity, substance misuse, self-mutilation, and PTSD. Emotional abuse may exist on its own or in conjunction with physical or sexual abuse. Although it is less obvious and more difficult to assess than physical violence, you can identify it through indicators such as low self-esteem, reported feelings of inadequacy, anxiety and withdrawal, learning difficulties, and poor impulse control. Neglect. Neglected children and older adults often appear undernourished, dirty, and poorly clothed. Neglect, neglect is also manifested by inadequate medical care, such as lack of immunizations and untreated medical or dental conditions. Economic abuse. Economic abuse may take the form of failure to provide for the needs of a victim when the adequate funds are available. Bills may be left unpaid by the person in charge of the finances, which may result in disconnection of the heat or electricity. In case of spousal abuse, the perpetrator may prevent the victim from pursuing education or finding a job, thereby ensuring dependency. Level of anxiety and coping responses. Nonverbal responses to the assessment interview may indicate of the victim's anxiety level. Agitation and anxiety bordering on panic are often present in victims experiencing violence. Because they live in terror, abused individuals remain vigilant and unable to relax or sleep. Signs and somatic symptoms of living with chronic stress and severe levels of anxiety include hypertension, irritability, and GI disturbances. Hesitation, lack of eye contact, and use of vague statements such as, it's been rough lately, indicate that the situation is difficult to talk about. Coping mechanisms used by many victims to endure living in violent and terrifying situations often prevent the termination of the relationship. These coping mechanisms may take the form of flawed beliefs or myths, Table 28.2. Because of feelings of confusion, shame, despair, and powerlessness, victims may withdraw from interactions with others, increasing their isolation. Uh, this table is pretty big. We can look at that later. Family coping patterns. To effectively assess abuse, the nurse must show willingness to listen and avoid any judgmental tone. It is important to assess family strengths as well as stressors. Questioning about memories of early family relationships can provide additional information about uh, attitudes in the home and the way they might influence coping. Asking parents about how they were disciplined as children may provide insight into their child-rearing attitudes and practices. Living with and caring for children and older adults can create frustration, stress, and anger. Unless there are appropriate outlets for stress, abuse can occur. Box 28.4 is a useful guide for assessing the risk of a child and or adult abuse in the home. Box 28.4, factors to assess during a home visit. For a child, responsiveness to infant signals, caregiver facial expressions in response to infant, playfulness of caregiver with infant, Nature of physical contact during feeding and other caretaking activities. Temperament of infant. Caregiver's history of harsh discipline or abuse as a child. Parental attitudes. Feelings of inadequacy as a parent. Unrealistic expectations of child. Fear of doing something wrong. Attribution of negative qualities to newborn. Newborn. Uh, misdirected anger. Continued evidence of isolation, apathy, anger, frustration, projection, adult conflict. Environmental conditions, sleeping arrangements, child management, home management, use of supports, formal and informal. Need for immediate services for situational, economics, child care, emotional, or educational information. Information about hotlines, babysitters, homemakers, parent groups. Information about child development. Information about child care and home management services. For an older adult, Absence of or lack of access to basic necessities, such as food, water, and medications. Unsafe housing. Lack of or inadequate utilities, ventilation, or space. Poor physical hygiene. Lack of assistive devices, such as hearing aids, eyeglasses, wheelchair. Medication mismanagement. Outdated prescriptions or unmarked bottles. 
Support systems. The person experiencing abuse is usually in a dependent position relying on the perpetrator for basic needs. This dependence, along with the isolation the perpetrator imposes on the person, limits the victim's access to support systems. Children's options are especially limited, as are those of the physically and mentally disabled. Assessing for support should focus on interpersonal, interpersonal, and community resources. Suicide potential. A person experiencing violence may feel desperate to leave, yet be trapped in an abusive relationship. Suicide may seem like the only option. In fact, victims of intimate partner violence are twice as likely to attempt suicide. Horrifying cases of murder-suicide are most likely to occur in the context of this type of abuse. Elder abuse and neglect are strongly associated in cases of suicide in the older adult population. Children who are subjected to abuse are at increased risk for suicide as adults. Sexual abuse and, to a lesser degree, physical abuse create this risk. The identity of the abuser and the frequency of the abuse influence the degree of suicide risk. When the abuser is an immediate family member, and when the abuse is repeated, the risk is increased. A suicide attempt may be the presenting problem in the emergency department. The sensitive question is conducted in a caring manner. The nurse can elicit the history of violence. Often the means of attempted suicide is overdose or the combination of alcohol and other central nervous system depressants or sleeping medications. When the crisis of the immediate suicide attempt has been resolved, careful questioning to determine lethality is in order. For example, if the patient still feels that life is not worth living, has a suicide plan, and has a means to carry it out, you must consider admission to an inpatient patient psychiatric unit. On the other hand, if the patient is talking about future plans and about staying for the sake of the children, outpatient referrals are appropriate. Homicide potential. When working with an abused spouse, ask whether the patient feels safe going home and if so, whether a safety plan is in place for when the violence occurs. Always assess the potential for lethality. Certain factors place a vulnerable person at greater risk for homicide, including the following. The presence of a gun in the home, alcohol and drug misuse, history of violence on the part of the perpetrator in other situations, extreme jealousy and obsessiveness on the part of the perpetrator. The perpetrator of violence may eventually become the victim. Therefore, always ask individuals victimized by violence if they have ever felt like killing the perpetrator. If yes, ask whether they have the means to do so. If the answer is yes, intervention is required. Drug and alcohol use. A person experiencing violence may self-medicate with alcohol or other drugs as a way of escaping an intolerable situation. The drugs are usually CNS depressants, such as benzos, prescribed by physicians for stress-related symptoms, e.g. insomnia, GI upsets, anxiety, and difficulty concentrating. Assess for a chronic alcohol or drug problem and provide appropriate treatment referrals. The patient should not be discharged to the abuser. Treatment choices can include both inpatient and outpatient options. Maintaining accurate records. Because of the possibility of future legal action, it is essential that the healthcare record contain an accurate and detailed description of the victim's medical history, the psychosocial history of the family, and observations of the family interactions during the interviews. Especially important in documentation of findings from the initial assessment are one, verbatim statements of who caused the injury and when it occurred. Two, a body map to indicate size, color, shape, areas, and types of injuries with explanations. Three, physical evidence of sexual abuse when possible. Follow procedures for evidence collection carefully as this can impact legal action. If the abuse has just occurred, ask the patient to return in a day or two for more photographs as bruises may be evident at that time. You must assure the patient of the confidentiality of the record and of its power should legal action be initiated. Even if intervention does not occur at this time, begin the record. The next provider will be aware of the problem and will be in a better position to offer support. Assessment guidelines, family violence, little box here. Assess, one, signs and symptoms of victims of abuse, two, potential for abuse in vulnerable families, for example, some indicators of vulnerable parents who might benefit from education and instruction and effective coping techniques. Three, physical, sexual, and or emotional abuse and neglect and economic maltreatment of older adults. Four, family coping patterns. Five, patient support systems. Six, drugs or alcohol use. Seven, suicidal or homicidal ideas. Eight, post-trauma syndrome. Self-assessment. Working with those who experience violence may arouse intense and overwhelming feelings. 
Strong negative feelings towards abuse may cloud your judgment and interfere with objective assessment and intervention, no matter how you try to cover or de deny personal bias. Common responses of healthcare professionals to violence are listed in Table 28.3. Uh, table 28.3, we have anger, embarrassment, confusion, fear, anguish, helplessness, discouragement, and the blame the victim mentality. And there's some descriptions off to the side there that we can read later. A personal history of abuse may cause you to identify too closely with the victim, and personal issues connected with the abuse may surface, further clouding judgment. Sharing perceptions and feelings with other professionals can help reduce feelings of isolation and discomfort. Diagnosis. Focus your nursing diagnosis <coughs> on the underlying causes and symptoms of family violence. While many of the diagnoses are directed toward protecting vulnerable family members, it can also include the perpetrator and plans of care. Safety is the number one concern and is addressed in risk for violence, other directed or self-directed. Risk for suicide, pain, and risk for infection Rape trauma syndrome is addressed in chapter 29. Living in a situation where vulnerable individuals feel unsafe and helpless warrants the nursing diagnoses of anxiety, fear, hopelessness, and powerlessness. Constant negative messages and being treated in a disrespectful manner suggest a diagnosis of situational and chronic low self-esteem. Deficits in managing day-to-day -day responsibilities are addressed in ineffective individual coping. The family, as patient gets focus with diagnosis of dysfunctional family process, impaired parenting, disabled family coping, caregiver role, role strain, and ineffective role performance. Outcomes identification. The nursing outcomes classification provides an overall outcome where the individual is free from being hurt or exploited, which is called abuse cessation. The following indicators address specific types of abuse. Physical abuse has ceased. Emotional abuse has ceased. Sexual abuse has ceased. Financial exploitation has ceased. Ratings that you might find quite useful in determining the degree to which an outcome has been met are available in NOC, pages 71 to 76. These scales include abuse cessation, abuse protection, abuse recovery, and abuse recovery, emotional, financial, physical, or sexual. An additional outcome addresses the perpetrator with abusive behavior, self-restraint. Other outcomes focus on addressing the nursing diagnosis described in the previous section. You should make the identification of desired outcomes patient-centered and therefore developed in conjunction with the survivor and primary support person. Continuous, continually reassess these outcomes and revise them as new information about the survivor need emerges. Table 28.4 identifies signs and symptoms, potential nursing diagnosis, and outcomes for victim of child, intimate partner, elder abuse, as well as for abusers. We can look at that table later. Planning. Nurses and other healthcare workers encounter abuse frequently, not only in healthcare settings, but also in their communities and families. The nurse is often the first point of contact for people experiencing abuse, and thus is in an ideal position to contribute to prevention, detection, and effective intervention. The Joint Commission requires staff education in family violence and abuse, as well as the development of standards of care to guide clinical practice. Most hospitals and community centers provide protocols for dealing with child, intimate partner, or elder abuse. Unless it is a case of child abuse in which the child has been removed from the home, most interventions performed after necessary emergency care will take place within the community. Plans should center on the patient's safety first. Whenever it is possible or in the best interest of the patients, pla uh, plans should be discussed with the patient. Planning should also take into consideration the need of the abuser, e.g. parents, caretaker, spouse, or partner, if they are motivated to learning alternatives to abuse and violence. Implementation. Reporting abuse. Nurses are legally mandated to report suspected or actual cases of child and vulnerable adult abuse. Appropriate agency may be the state or county child welfare agency, law enforcement agency, juvenile court, or county health department. Each state has specific guidelines for reporting, including whether a report can be oral, written, or both, and within what time period the suspected abuse or neglect might be reported, immediately within 24 hours or within 48 hours. 
Every abused person is a crime victim, and assault with a weapon is reportable in most states. All 50 states have marital rape statutes. The following vignette gives an example of a child abuse case that requires reporting. Vignette. Two nurses who work in a family practice clinic are suspicious of child abuse. Hannah, 12 years old, has recurrent urinary tract infections. Her father, who accompanies her into the bathroom when she is providing urine samples, always brings her to clinic visits. He answers all questions for Hannah, even when providers direct the questions to her. After pressure by the nurses, the physician agrees to ask Hannah some questions in private. The nurses think the physician has minimized the problem, asked superficial questions, and dismiss their concerns. They decide to report their concerns to CPS. They inform the father who becomes outraged at their accusations and threatens to change doctors. Subsequent investigation confirms the likelihood of sexual abuse, and Hannah is placed in temporary foster care for follow-up counseling. Father refuses treatment and threatens to sue the nurses. Four months, four months later, the father leaves the family. Wow. The case in the preceding vignette illustrates that a reasonable basis for suspecting abuse, not proof, is all that is required to report. Nurses must attempt to maintain both an appropriate level of suspicion and a neutral objective attitude. One can be too concerned to jump to conclusions, which is what the physician in this case thought the nurses were doing. On the other hand, too little concern can result in an incomplete examination to avoid confrontation, which is what the nurses thought the physician was doing. Given these opposing stances, the case is reported as required by law and ethical standards, and CPS was given the opportunity to investigate. Culture. Culture is important because it is central to how people organize their experience. Even the most acculturated people have a tendency to revert to their cultural past in organizing coping strategies after a stressful event. If there is a language barrier, the nurse should speak slowly and clearly in English without using jargon and allow time for the response. If the patient speaks no English, provide a trained medical interpreter. A family member should not be used as an interpreter to ensure confidentiality and protect the person from future retaliation. Box 28.5 is a personalized safety guide. There's a lot of stuff there. We can look at it later. Counseling. Counseling includes crisis intervention me measures. It is important to emphasize that people have a right to live without fear of violence, physical harm, or assault. Telling an abused person that no one deserves to be hit can be a powerful statement in and of itself. The role of the nurse is to support the victim, counsel about safety, and facilitate access to other resources as appropriate. You should counsel individuals experiencing intimate partner violence about developing a safety plan, a plan for a rapid escape when abuse occurs. Ask patients to identify the signs of escalation of violence and to pick a particular sign that will tell them that now is the time to leave. If children are present, they can all agree on a code word that, when spoken by the parent, means it's time to go. If the individual plans ahead, it may be possible to leave before the violence occurs. It is important that the plan include a destination and transportation. The nurse should suggest packing the items listed in box 28.5 ahead of time. The person should keep the packed bag in a place where the perpetrator will not find it. If a survivor of intimate partner violence chooses to leave, shelters or safe houses for both sexes are available in most communities. They are open 24 hours a day and can be reached through hotline information numbers, hospital emergency departments, YWCAs, or the local office of the National Organization for Women. The address of the house is usually kept secret to protect abused individuals from attack by the perpetrator. Besides offering protection, many of these shelters and safe houses serve important educational and conscious raising functions. Patients should be given the number of the nearest available shelter, even if they decide for the present to stay with their partners. Case management. Community mental health centers are becoming increasingly involved in the delivery of services to victims and perpetrators of abuse. Nurses working in these settings have the opportunity to coordinate community medical, criminal justice, and social services to provide comprehensive assistance to families in crisis. A nurse functioning in a case manager role can assist the patient in choosing the best options and coordinating the interventions of several agencies. Box 28.6 
lists selected NIC interventions for abuse protection support for children, intimate partners, and older adults. Promotion of community support. An important intervention is to support help seeking. You may provide referral numbers and even stand by as the patient makes a phone call for an appointment. Make specific referrals regarding emergency financial assistance and legal counseling available to each patient. Vocational counseling is another referral that may be appropriate. Give patients referrals to parenting resources that enable them to explore alternative approaches to discipline, e.g. no hitting, slapping, or other expressions of violence. Box 28.6, Interventions for Abuse Protection, Big Box, we can read it later. Health Teaching and Health Promotion. In families at risk for abuse, health teaching and health promotion include meeting with both the individual and the family to help them learn to recognize behaviors in situations that might trigger violence. Explain normal developmental and physiological changes to enable family members to gain a more positive view of the victim and crisis situation. Gaining a more complete understanding can help family members broaden their insight and thus increase their compassion. They may then begin to anticipate new stress situations and be able to prepare them for before a crisis occurs. Nurses who work on a maternity unit are often in a position to identify risk factors for abuse between new parents and initiate appropriate interventions, including education about effective parenting and coping techniques. Share information about these interventions with the patient's healthcare team for appropriate monitoring and follow-up. Parents who are candidates for special attention include the following. New parents whose behavior towards the infant is rejecting, hostile, or indifferent. Teenage parents who require special help in handling the baby and discussing the expectations of the baby and their support systems. Parents with cognitive deficits for whom careful, explicit, and repeated instructions on caring for the child and recognizing the infant's needs are indicated. Parents who grew up watching their mothers be abused. This is a significant risk factor for perpetuation of family violence. Nurses can also recognize when children are at risk and make referrals to community resources, including emergency child care facilities, emergency telephone numbers, numbers of 24-hour crisis centers or hotlines, and respite programs in which volunteers take the children for an occasional weekend so the parents can get some relief. Community health nurses can make home visits to identify risk factors for abuse in the crucial first few months of life during which the style of parent-child interactions is established. See Box 28.4 for important factors for the community health nurse to assess during a home care visit. Such observations made by nurses in clinic and public health settings are fundamental case findings and evaluation. Prevention of abuse. Primary prevention consists of measures taken to prevent the occurrence of abuse, identifying individuals and families at high risk, Providing health teaching and coordinating supportive services to prevent crises are examples of primary prevention. Specific strategies include reducing stress, reducing the influence of risk factors, increasing social support, increasing coping skills, increasing self-esteem. Community health nurses are in a unique position to assess family functioning in the home during visits for other medical problems. In addition, the community health nurse and clinic nurse maintain contact with the family over time, which allows for assessment of changes. They are also in an excellent position to connect parents to appropriate resources in the community that can meet their needs. All nurses can work to reduce society's acceptance of violence by working towards social policy change. Secondary prevention involves early intervention in abusive situations to minimize their disabling or long-term effects. Nurses can establish screening programs for individuals at risk, Participate in the medical treatment of injuries resulting from violent episodes. And coordinate community services to provide continuity of care. Healthcare professionals can help reduce stress and depression by providing support therapy, support groups, pharmacotherapy, and contact information for, for community resources. Social dysfunction or lack of information can be addressed by counseling and education. You can reduce caregiver burden by arranging assistance in caring for the family member, housekeeping, or in cases which caregiving needs exceed even optimal caregiver capacity by placing the patient in a more appropriate setting. The following vignette illustrates a successful secondary prevention effort. Vignette. Six-year-old Gavin is brought to the school nurse by his teacher. 
who said he had complained of an upset stomach. When the nurse examines Gavin, she notices bruise on his arms and abdomen. Gavin appears frightened and hesitant to speak. Nurse, how did you hurt yourself, Gavin? Gavin looks down and starts to cry. It's okay if you don't want to talk about it. Gavin does not look at the nurse and speaks softly. My mom hit me. Tell me what happened before that. Mom was mad because I didn't put my toys away. What does your mom usually do when she gets mad? She yells mostly. Sometimes she hits me. Tell me about the hitting. Mom hits me a lot since my dad left. Gavin starts to cry himself. Cry to himself. Gavin appears well nourished and properly dressed. He is at his approximate developmental age, except for some language delay. However, because of the physical evidence and history, the nurse notifies CPS and the family situation is evaluated for possible placement of Gavin in protective custody. The initial evaluation concludes that there is no indication of serious potential harm to the child and that Gavin should return home. The mother, who is initially defensive, starts to cry and states, I can't cope with being alone and I don't know where to turn. Nursing intervention center on caring for Gavin's immediate health needs, finding support for the mother and help, cope and help her cope with crises, providing a counseling referral for the mother to learn alternative ways of expressing anger and frustration and informing the mother of parents groups. Tertiary prevention, which often occurs in mental health settings, involves nurses facilitating and healing and rehabilitative process by counseling individuals and families, providing support for groups of survivors, and assisting survivors of violence to achieve their optimal level of safety, health, and well-being. Legal advocacy programs for survivors of intimate partner violence are an example of tertiary prevention. Complementary therapies such as mindfulness-based stress reduction can also assist survivors in the healing process. Advanced practice interventions. A nurse who is educated at the master's or doctoral level and is certified in advanced practice psychiatric nursing is qualified to conduct psychotherapy. This type of therapy is most effective after a crisis intervention when the situation is less chaotic and tumultuous. A variety of therapeutic modalities are available for treatment of abusive families. Individual psychotherapy. The goals of individual therapy for a survivor are empowerment, the ability to recognize and choose productive life options, and the development of a solid sense of self. People who have experienced abuse as a child or have left a violent relationship may choose individual therapy to address symptoms of depression, anxiety, somatization, or PTSD. Many of the psychological symptoms shown by women who have been abused can be understood as complex survival strategies and responses to violence. Nurses must address the guilt, shame, and stigmatization experienced by survivors of abuse. It is helpful for nurses to understand that the individual's feelings and behaviors may be reflective of the grieving process because he or she has experienced numerous losses as a result of the abusive relationship. Helping the survivor work through the stages of grieving can promote healing. Individual psychotherapy is often indicated for the perpetrator, particularly when an individual psychopathological process is identified. Therapy for the perpetrator is most effective when it is court mandated because the perpetrator is more likely to complete the course of treatment. Nurses engaged in therapy with perpetrators have a duty to warn potential victims if they conclude that the perpetrator is a danger. Refer to Chapter 6 for a more detailed discussion of the duty to warn and duty to protect. Family Psychotherapy Because abuse is a symptom of a family in crisis, each part of the family system needs attention. Also, because change in one member of the family system affects the whole system, all members need support and understanding. Interventions may maximize positive interactions among all family members. Couples therapy can put the abused partner at increased risk of harm or even death. Conjoint therapy should take place only if the perpetrator has had individual therapy and has demonstrated change as a result and if both parties agree to participate. Expected outcomes are that the perpetrator will recognize destructive patterns of behavior, learn alternative responses, 
control impulses, and refrain from abusive behavior. Intermediate goals are that the member of the family will openly communicate and learn to listen to one another. Refer to Chapter 35 for more detailed discussion of family therapy. Group psychotherapy. Participation in therapy groups provides assurances that one is not alone and that change is possible. Because many survivors of abuse have been isolated, they have been deprived of validation and positive feedback from others. Working in a group can help diminish feelings of isolation, strengthen feelings of self-esteem and self-worth, and increase the potential for realistic problem-solving in a supportive atmosphere. Groups often use cognitive behavioral techniques to help the abuser see abusive actions as behavioral patterns that they can change. In therapy groups, perpetrators learn to recognize the thoughts preceding an abusive incident, the responses to the thoughts, and how to interrupt negative feelings about their partners. Perpetrators who have never discussed problems with anyone before are encouraged to discuss their thoughts and feelings. Group therapy can help create a community of healing and restoration. Refer to Chapter 34 for a more detailed discussion of group therapy. Evaluation. Failures of interventions with abusive families often are due to problems within the social, economic, and political systems in which we live. Nurses can direct their interventions to the social environment. Questions that nurses should consider are, is corporal punishment an acceptable technique for guiding behavior in children? How do we address the unequal burden of caregiving responsibilities placed on women? Why is a low priority given to education and preparation for parenthood? How can we change the belief that older adults have little social value? Next, we have a case study, and that would bring us to the end of the chapter. Bam, bam.